ladies and gentlemen, I'll introduce each person properly uh, as we speak to them, but this is just a brief opportunity. We've got 15 or 20 minutes to hear from our panel, but also from people in the audience, what are the things we need to chat about? I think after that fantastic introduction by Rhonda Galbally, uh, with reference to Dickens, which is always a tremendously good idea if I could <laughs> support that, what are we really needing to talk about? Not just in our personal lives, but in our national advocacy to make a good death possible for everyone. So that's basically what we're going to focus on now. Guys, I am a passionate believer in audience participation. So just before I come to my panel, I want to meet a few people in the audience. Where's uh, Professor Richard Chai? Where are you, Richard? Good on you, mate. I'm going to hurtle towards you, so if you'd stand up. And Professor Chai has come from Sydney, where he's uh, uh, the head of the Sacred Heart a hospice and also palliative care in eastern Sydney, which is all the major hospitals. What does that phrase, a good death, mean to you? Your whole life's committed to it. What does it mean? A good death doesn't mean euthanasia, even though euthanasia actually means a good death. A good death is about good symptom control 99% of the time, but supported 100% of the time. And that's the difference, that I'm walking with my patients 100% of the time, even though pain may not be 100% controlled, where it's not, and the same with nausea, the same with shortness of breath. But I think a good death starts with good medical decision making. G making sure that the right patient gets the right decision, gets the right treatment, and making sure that the patient doesn't get treated or over-treated and suffer as a result of that. And that's what we don't do in our hospitals. You're passionate about training and you're involved in training uh, doctors, nurses and allied health and he's received an award from the College of Physicians for his work in this area. Where are we up to in the quality of training for all the people who have contact with people in those last weeks and months of life? If you had to score us as a nation naught to ten, how are we going? I think we're actually doing well. I'll give ourselves eight out of ten. The main the, 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 the reason why we haven't got 10 out of 10 is that we don't have enough doctors who are interested in palliative care. And part of it is because death is still seen as a failure. And therefore, why go into a profession that deals with failure? And that's the, the biggest hurdle that we have uh, in terms of, of trying to get people to understand what we can do as palliative care. And, and places like what we're doing today will actually try and improve that message that, that the treatment of patients who are dying is actually very, very rewarding rather than being seen as a failure itself. I've just come back from Lisbon from the, the palliative care conference and I think Australia is very much up there with where palliative care is, where palliative medicine is, how we care for our patients. I don't think we're actually very far behind or even I think we are very much at the top of where we are in looking after patients in all aspects of care. Look, thank you. I have 400 other questions I want to ask this gentleman but we'll do that in our forum. Would you give him a round of applause, please? Um, Tom Calmer, Tom, do you mind just coming and standing over here so people can stare at us? I'm a great believer in visuals. Uh, Tom, of course, a uh, commissioner and a great advocate now for stopping smoking. What's, what does a good death mean to you? Oh, look, uh, from a personal level, it's, it's being around uh, family, uh, to be able to die in dignity on, on uh, and in a place um, that, that's meaningful. Um, for other Aboriginal people, it, it'll differ. Too often it's about... Um, being dislocated from your land and, and your culture and your society. And, um, and we need to try and address that and make sure that when we do look at um, Aboriginal health, we don't look, just look at uh, the treatment, um, you know, for all the chronic diseases that we suffer, but really look at, at more on the prevention, which we're doing, um, but the end of life we're not doing enough looking at. It strikes me, let's chat about dying... Every Aboriginal person I know never stops chatting about dying because you have such a burden of death. You're at funerals so much, but this is a different kind of chatting, isn't it? It's about quality of life. Yeah, well, very much so because it's uh, too often uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is dying very young, dying very, um, uh, you know, without without uh, ageing and without having um, the need for for long treatment. And and uh, we need to to really look at that and make sure that the the services are available and and, uh, and I think that's a conversation that even within the health sector, the Indigenous health sector, we need to take up a lot more. Look, thank you so much, Tom. Would you give Tom a round of applause? 
I'll just meet one more person from the audience, if I may. Uh, we have a gentleman here from Western Australia where I think you do care about state of origin, but I don't know how you relate to it, but don't worry about that now. Mark Cocaine, do you mind coming out? The most amazing name, of course. Uh, a, a palliative care nurse originally and now a, a, a leader with the Silver Chain Group uh, in Western Australia. I guess a good death at home or in aged care, what does that mean to you? Um, well, I suppose complementary to what Tom and Richard have said, I think at a personal level for me, it's about being surrounded by family and friends and uh, quality of life. Um, I think one of the main things for me is really about cho about real choice of, uh, of place of death and place of care. And uh, to do that, it's really about the resources we have in the community. I think there's a, a real disparity across the country in terms of the resources that are afforded, particularly within the community, to help to care for people at home. And I think with that as well, it's about the resources that we have, about the expertise in the community to support the client, the patient and uh, their family and carers. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Would you give him a, a clap as well? <laughs> I, I'll come to our panel and I, if I can, I will come back to the audience. But Rhonda, can I just ask you one quick question? And, and thank you again for that thought-provoking presentation. But you talked about control and dying with dignity and indeed so did our minister talk about control and dying with dignity. And it struck me that many people who aren't afraid of death are afraid of dying and, and that at the heart of that is a fear of loss of control. And I wonder if we can get people to feel confident about palliative care without giving them more control throughout their health experience. They need control at birth. They need control when they're... Do you see what I'm trying to say? That issue of having a sense of participation in healthcare decision-making, it's not just about in the last days of life, is it? It's critical all the way through. Yes, um, I think it's a really interesting point that you're making, actually. And um, at the women's hospital um, that I chair, we're just <laughs> reviewing research... Um, from Yale University that shows that when you get patients involved in governance of healthcare, you get much higher quality healthcare, which sort of makes sense. But hardly anyone does really. You know, actually, you have patient complaint systems, but you don't have um, patients actually involved in decision making um, in hospitals, at least in Australia, or not not often. And I think that that's um, a really interesting question. I mean, I guess the issue of control for me has a double-edged sword. That number one, of course, every human being wants to have control. But if you, if you rigidly... Ex like, letting go of control is also part of living. So when to sort of have control and when to be able to let go and just expect that others are going to take care of you and um, be able to do that really well, I think, is a, a big struggle. Because if, you can, if you're really, really into control right up to the end, I think that also would be quite a... Um, would have quite a lot of negative, you know, as to when can you just let go? Uh, I mean, that's one uh, of yes, the questions I suppose, of dying. I, I suppose... When can you let go? But uh, that's, ve that's also very interesting. But I guess in my thoughts of exploring control, I was thinking to your role in the... Preventative health agency because to preventing illness is about having a sense of autonomy and personal control over one's life, and that extends then to the process of the latter part of life. Well, prevention primarily is about having the policy, the environment, um, the capacity within communities so that you can be well, and it's the same for dying. Like there's a big um, debate about how much in prevention um, you can actually take individual responsibility if you don't have a healthy and supportive environment. Um, so that is, and I think it's a similar debate in dying. Um, how much is it your own decision making when you, you haven't, you don't have community care that's sufficiently resourced, when you don't have um, an ethos in society that means you're touchable right at the end. Um, you, you want a healthy and supportive environment for dying as you do for any preventative action. Look, thank you very much, Rhonda. If I could pass the microphone to Senator Judith Adams, uh, co-chair of, of our group here today. I have a question for you, but before I do it, what's the 
the critical issue from your perspective we need to start talking about nationally? Um, I think nationally um, I'm a passionate rural person having spent a lot of time in the um, rural area yeah. and um, rural health and I think our small community hospitals which um, unfortunately in WA we are mm. having a few problems about um, the role and um, the role they'll continue to play but it's amazing the number of people that um, having Perth as our main city um, when it comes to finally um, the end, maybe those people have relocated up to Perth, often they will go back to the community where they were and um, be looked after by people that they've known or you know, had connections with over a long time. And I think that is terribly important. And, and, and Senator, you're, you're not talking there only about Aboriginal people, are you? You're talking about other people go back to country as I'm it were. I'm certainly talking about um, everyone, yes. Yeah. Aboriginal people do go back to country, but um, there's an awful lot of other people that really do, when they get older, feel that's where they came from, that's where they want to go back to. And we have some brilliant people working in these small um, health centres and hospitals that are very, very capable of um, looking after people with palliative care. And um, to the end. It's interesting. The question I wanted to ask you, Senator, was this, you know, this dream of equity of access. We all talk about equity of access and equal quality for everyone. And yet we know how variable it is around the country. And I was going to ask you, how do we achieve this dream of equity of access? How do you see it in that rural and remote? <laughs> well, looking straight at Gordon Gregory there, Gordon and I have been uh, friends for many years in my involvement with the Alliance before I became a Senator. Um, look, it's something we've been fighting for for a long, long time and it's not going to happen in one fell swoop but we just have to keep up that pressure and I think with the palliative care issue with those smaller community hospitals, they do have a role to play and the people that work in the communities do have a role to play and it's um, just so good to see um, people that have played a very large role in the community come back to their um Roots yeah. to probably spend the last few weeks or months of their lives. Well, thank you so much. If you could pass the microphone, please, to uh, Professor Patsy Yates, who's the Vice President of Palliative Care Australia and also uh, Director of everything to do with palliative care research and education for Queensland Health. That's a decent spread of, of, of country you're covering. I, I, what I wanted to ask you this notion of a good death that we've been talking about. I guess the challenge is to make it possible in every setting, home, hospital, aged care. It, it, how is, is, what are you doing in Queensland and what needs to happen nationally so that who, wherever you happen to be at your last moment, because you don't always have time to get into an ambulance and go somewhere else, do you? Sometimes it happens suddenly. What do we need to do so there's always people available to help us have a good death? And, I mean, I, I think there's so many things that need to be done. Um, I think that it's, it's just not one thing that's going to fix palliative care. I, I think you're quite right say, in saying that we have the ability or we should have the ability to be able to care for people where they would like to die. And that means that we need to continue to build capacity in our communities, um, at the community level, as well as in the community health service level. So the community sector and the sort of additional supports that people may need for things um, to um, uh, provide respite for the carer, you know, some, house, some assistance with housework. So all the community supports need to be in place. We need to make sure that we've got systems that clearly um, link with our um, acute systems because the thing about palliative care these days and, and a good death and Richard mentioned it is a whole is it's not just about holding hands it's about also providing that good medical symptom control so we need capacity in our systems that are flexible to make sure that that can kick in when it's needed um, but not necessarily take over and have systems which are just so acutely focused that it isn't responsive to the holistic needs that someone has. Could I just take uh, uh, that a little further, that idea of the critical nature of symptom control? I, as I understand from my pre-reading for today, the ma vast majority of Australians say they want to die at home. And I sort of understand that personally, but then I say to myself, I might get into trouble at a very odd hour on a weekend. And in my experience, well, if I want good symptom control at a very odd hour in a weekend, a hospital's not a bad spot to be. 
And so is there anywhere in Australia where you think we have networks so well developed that if you were with your community palliative care team suddenly in bad travel, you know, 2 a.m. Sunday, uh, that you could get support then? Yeah, I, th I think some services have got this working well, uh, but I think um, across the board it would be true to say that that's not something which would be a feature of our system. We're not so good at actually that after hours care and we're still not so good at those um, that smooth transition to get the right care at the right time yeah, across the board. But so so what will need services. to happen because if we're going to... Obviously, many people in this room want to reduce costs in acute care hospitals. Let's be honest. There is an economic underpinning as well as a humane and spiritual underpinning. If we're going to have our mummers and sisters and brothers trust us, you can stay at home. How much work do we have to do that it's safe to stay at home in symptom control terms? Yeah. Look, I think um, community services are, are generally doing... Uh, are, are we're, we're really learning a lot about what we need to do to ensure that there is that 24-hour and that responsive system. What do we need to do? I think we need to continue to sort of break down some of the barriers between our silos in the health system so that um, people can move in and out very easily. We, need to, we do need um, more um, resources which can... Um, which can cover that 24-hour period. And I think one of the things that we also need to think about is education across the health sector for groups like our paramedics, for example, so that if there is an acute emergency situation, we've got all of our parts of the health system understanding how best to treat that um, and how best to sort of make sure that they get the right service. Yeah. Because, of course, chemists aren't open at 2am on a Sunday either, so you can't get things filled. Um, look, thank you so much. I, mean, I don't normally run down the line, but we have tight time, time constraints, so I will. Uh, and it's my, my great pleasure now to welcome uh, Dr Yvonne Luxford, who, of course, is the CEO of Palliative Care Australia and our, and our host, in a sense. I've got two quick questions for you. When I was reading my materials that you gave me, there was a really strong emphasis on relationships in dying well. What, what's this relationships issue? Well, I, th I think there's different levels of relationship issues. I, I think one thing that's really important is that people have the um, ability to have the choice of who's with them when they're dying so that you can choose to be surrounded by your loved ones I think is a really important thing in, in terms of relationships. Um, I think there's also issues about relationships with your health professional and people often want to remain, um, have their end of life care with the health professional they've come to know, especially in rural areas with their GP. So what Patsy was just saying then about education is really vital. Of, of course, we still need our specialist palliative care services, but we really need our primary carers to have really good training and education in, um, in end of life care so that they can conduct that also. So it's almost like it's, it, particularly with the, I am a baby boomer heading down, <laughs> heading along the road, there's going to be so many more of us. It's almost like everyone's going to have to have retraining and updating in palliative care approaches to care. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think another rela relationship too that we should mention, we've been talking a lot about people wanting to die at home, but there's also patients will sometimes have a relationship, a close relationship with the team in a hospital that exactly. they've built up, say renal patients who have been continually seeing the same group. So we have to accept that as well, that there, there are different relationships involved here and, and it comes back down to choice, doesn't it, where people would actually like to die. Um, I know we need to talk about, chat about dying because it's the taboo that stops us talking about palliative care. But palliative care actually isn't about dying, is it? It's about how you live mm. in mm. that indeterminately lengthy period before the last breath. And you see how there's a sort of a tension there, isn't there? Because uh, in my own life where I've tried to talk about palliative care, I don't want to talk about that, it's about death. But it's not about death, is it? Well, no, it's, it's about the best quality of life in, in, the, uh, in the lead up to death, if you like. I, I, that's probably a better way to say it, but it wasn't so catchy. <laughs> no, I, I guess I, I was lucky enough to have someone I love die uh, where, uh, at the Sacred Heart Hospice in uh, Darlinghurst. And it's a lively place. I visited it regularly over a number of weeks and it's, it's a living place. Uh, so it was that sense that is hard to convey to the uninitiated about good palliative 
care. I, I, I think so. And I think anybody who's visited a service mm. such as a hospice will, will realise that it, it's not a terribly morose, horrible place at all, which some people might imagine it to be. Instead, it's a place where there's, there's still a lot of living going on. Yes, a place of grace mm. often, if it's going well. Mm. Uh, Senator Claire Moore, I know you weren't meant to be on the yeah. panel, but I couldn't resist putting you there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I suppose... I. You're a reformer. You're into reforming things. And one of the places I get hope about this is we, we, we've changed birth within our lifetime. Um, birth used to be an isolated, lonely thing high on a narrow trolley behind flippy, flappy plastic things. Do you remember that? And now it's like a three-ring circus. We hardly let doctors in there. I mean, it's, it's a riot. You've got 400 people, a few dogs, food, movies. Has anyone been to a birth lately? And I'm just talking mainstream public hospitals here, nothing special. So I'm being stupid. But in a way, I'd like to, to die the way I've seen some people born. I want that freedom of people to feel comfortable in the space, whether it's a nursing home or a hospital or, or my home. Is that the vision of it? I think the important thing is having those options and choice. And I think people everywhere should have informed choice. So all these people have been talking about the things that we know and share, that we have knowledge because we've been dying for years and um, we know what people need. I don't think there's a lot of confusion about that. I think there's a lot of um, certainty for, for many people. But everyone has a different, a different focus. So we need to have options that are known and fully resourced and available and that people, it's a personal thing so that people have talked a lot about being in families and at home but there's so many people that don't have families or home so we've got to work with them as well. So we have so much knowledge in this room. I think what we need to do is share it and then make sure that we work with governments at all levels because once again it's that issue but it, there's no right way to do it. Um, it's what each person needs. Uh, I... Um You've given me a trigger for something I wanted to mention anyway. None of us have mentioned faith. But, of course, for many people in our community, faith is part of the journey and part of how they deal with it. And of all the things Rhonda said in that speech, when she talked about the person who, who might die alone at home, that was the thing that really sent a rocket off in my head because those sort of people, in my experience, in an acute care setting, often the person who spends time with them is someone who's like a pastoral care worker... Like if you're in a Catholic hospital, it's usually in, you know one of those wild, out of control nuns in our community. The really old one. The really old one. I mean, I'm being foolish, but but do you know what I mean? I, and I just thought that issue of all our isolated people, who's with them, who's holding their hand, and that's another aspect, isn't it? What, maybe I could ask Patsy. It, Look, I, I think you're right. I mean, there's the statistics about the number of people who live alone today and um, what does that mean in terms of how we're going to provide end-of-life care? I, I don't think we've even started to imagine um, what how we're going to put in place so, such different services, um, how the issue of choice is going to become much more limited for those people. And I know some of the... Um, um, some of the considerations that have um, sort of come up in, th in the Productivity Commission and those sorts of things which the government's looking at at the moment are really critical for our future if we are actually going to aspire to um, uh, good quality um, dying. Because I guess I'm thinking in an acute care setting, if that happens to be where you die, and it still is where most of us are dying, isn't it? If you don't... You know that moment Rhonda spoke about where you actually have to let go and it's over now, the tubes go and I've seen it all happen, suddenly everything disappears, the room becomes quiet... Who's holding your hand if you're all by yourself? That, I guess, is the question I'm raising. And whether within our acute care settings, where there isn't a religious auspicing, are we doing enough for that side of the journey to death? It's just a, an observation. It's exactly the moment I have to finish, but an involuntary hand is something I can't resist. So if you could bring me brevity, I'd be grateful. Could you just stand and tell us who you are? Yes, Shirley Sarson. I'm patron of the ACT. Uh, palliative Care Society. And I just wanted to end that comment by saying I would hope that if you're dying alone, you've got a wonderful volunteer holding your hand. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder to leave your luggage here and please follow your leader in a few moments. who will bring you to our nine o'clock starting forum. But could I please hand over uh, to uh, Professor Patsy Yates who will formally close our session. Yes, I, I just wanted to, um, to close the session by thanking everybody for attending. We really um, are very um, appreciative of the support that you've provided for um, this um, breakfast and the campaign which is being launched today. We'd like to thank the Minister very much for... Um, launching and for the announcements and your, the support that you're providing for palliative care. Um, Rhonda, uh, such an eloquent speech that um, I'm, we're all very privileged to have heard this morning. Um, so thank you so much for that. And to members of the panel and um, to Senator Claire Moore in particular, who um, has been a great supporter of um, the Friends of Palliative Care, or whatever it's called now, <laughs> these, um, uh, for many, many years. And uh, we, we're really appreciative of that. So thank you very much, everyone. And have a good day and happy Palliative Care Week. <laughs>